I got an assault and uh, well, I had a, I had a motor vehicle theft, you know, partying and drinking and I got a deferred judgment. And while I was on that deferred judgment, I got an assault. So I got into it with a mutual friend at a party. One friend went and passed out in the back room and then he came back out and he said that he had money missing. So there was only a couple of guys that went in the back room and I really assumed that it was this other guy. It was one of our mutual friends. And when I confronted him, he got mad and he pushed me and swung on me and said something. So I ended up beating him up and then I threw him out the house. It was an apartment on the first floor and he landed on his stomach and then I shut the door. My girlfriend at the time told me that I had broke his arm when he landed. So I opened the door and looked. He wasn't there no more. We went right back to partying. I said, he's fine. He probably got up and went home. Next day, cops came knocking and they opened up the door. They came in, arrested me. Nobody, nobody told on me. It was only him. None of the guys there even said anything. And um, every, everyone there pretty much had my back. Um, the, the story is that that guy, he ended up walking and passing out in a field, middle of winter, and uh, he almost died. And luckily he passed out near a fire department. And the, so they found him, he's a diabetic, and yeah, he, he was in pretty pretty bad condition when they found him. So yeah, he almost died, and I'm very, I'm thank, thank God that they found him. And, uh, and man, thank God that they found him because it would have been a whole different story. And uh, so because I ruined my deferred judgment and it was an assault, I automatically ended up getting the time. Well, they ran it concurrent. I got three years, went to, uh, I ended up getting another assault when I was in the county waiting for the deferred judgment to come through. Uh, almost killed this guy. I gotten, it, it wasn't a gang thing, but it was one of my friends who got jumped. And, and cause I was already in the hole for fighting. And so they sent the guys that got in the fight in the regular pods from another building into building six, old building six. And I was on a third tier and one of the guys that they sent over, he was on my side. So one of my friends came from the other tier and came and told me, hey, there's that guy that got in a fight with so-so that jumped so-and-so. He's on your tier. He's right next to you. So like you have, you have to get that food for the homie. And so... They ended up popping the dip, popping the doors, and when they popped the doors, I told them what's up, and uh, yeah, so I almost threw I threw him off the tier, and he was hanging on by by the bars. And uh, good thing the cops came. And he was a Mexican dude. Um, they couldn't find him to, to to get to be a witness or nothing like that. But I didn't want to deal with trial and do all that stuff, so I ended up just taking the plea bargain on that because they promised just to run it concurrent. So I got another assault when I was in the county, and. Um, because of all that and just everything, my long record when I was in the county, they sent a file to DOC. So because of that, they sent me to ADSEG right away. I spent a year and a half in ADSEG. I think the first like three or four months, I didn't have a TV or nothing. Like it was just like, it was just an empty cell. Like I never did time like that where it was just an empty cell. You got out every other day to like use the phone or going go to the cage and got like an hour out there. And um, it was like 30 minutes and then you come out and you go use the phone and then you could go take a shower or whatever but everybody in the pod was all killers so they were all murderers doing you know 20 30 years plus life sentences already been down 15 20 years and um you know they schooled me how to do time and good thing i went there first honestly because you know they educated me a lot on respect and how to do things but obviously there was no rehabilitation they just gave you a television after a while and they used that as an incentive to keep you in line other than that they didn't have programs and nothing um, did about a year and a half, went straight to Buny after that. I think it was like, what, I'm trying to think when it was, 07, 06, 07. And, um, no, my wrong, I'm wrong. It was, this was before all that. And uh, so it was right after the riots. A lot of fighting was going on, um, a lot of drugs, violence. I remember one of my friends um, overdosed. He had a week to get out. His name's Kelly, Kelly P. I'm not going to say his full name, but just out of respect. But, um, yeah, he overdosed. He had, he had, he had been bringing drugs in when we were in Buny. And um, so, yeah, he overdosed, came back, 
wasn't feeling wasn't feeling so hot said he was overdosing you know none of his friends called the cops or anything um they didn't want to get in trouble so they let him die and then instead of calling the cops to get him help they dig the drugs out of his not gonna say but they dug the drugs out of it and this was all during after a visit and uh, one of my other friends came back from the visit and said where's cali at and so they told him oh he's he had been bringing drugs in for a while, but he was trying to make money so he could take it home before he went home. His wife had brought the drugs in and he had like two weeks before he got out. So he was trying to stack up as much as he could before he got out. He thought he was doing right. And, uh, my friend freaked out. He didn't, he was trying to do a really good character. He didn't care if he got in trouble. He said, you, you did this to him and you didn't care. And he grabbed him up by his foot and drug him down the thing and said, I don't care. My buddy's dying. He said to help him, but it was really too late. And that was, it, that's just the way it was there. And I mean, I'm just telling you how it was. Um, when I first went to intake, one of the guys was from an unpopular gang. He wasn't even a bad guy. Like he didn't even have bad character. He was a really good dude. But he was just part of a gang that wasn't very popular at the time. He got in three fights the first day. My intake, when he was escorting me from lunch and back, he got in three fights coming from Chow Hall back to intake. And that took like 10 minutes. Three fights. Bah, 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 bah. Stand up, wipe your nose. Fix himself so the cops didn't see nothing. Somebody else would run up. And it was all just happened so fast. And I remember asking him, is it like that here? And he was like, sometimes it is. And I remember going back to my cell and like doing push-ups. Like, man, this is like we're in Thunderdome. And uh, you don't realize how much that affects your psychology when you're in there. Like, it's programming. You're programming somebody. That's You're on defense all the time. Or you're on offense. And that's your defense. And... Um, that was how Buny was. And they sent me straight from there. There was no rehabilitation on that. Straight home. And so I did that three years. I went home and got out, went to my mom's house. It was probably the greatest time of my life. I got to be with my daughter. I, I had a daughter that I didn't know that I had before I went to jail. I found out I had her when I was in there. And she was already a year and a half. The mother tried to say some other guy was the father, but they he he found out. And so he took off and... And so I found out about my baby when I was in prison and I was just so excited to be with her. I was just so excited. And, uh, I remember her just crawling on my chest and I remember her just waking me up and it was just amazing. And I, and, and I loved her so much. And, uh, but I was drinking, I was hanging out with my friends. And I just went right back. I did, I did there. I did not have no coping skills. I did not have God in my life, nothing. You know, I was raised Catholic or whatever, and I didn't have no relationship, a personal relationship, and so whatever. And uh, so it was just partying. Three days after getting out, I ran into the victim of the previous case, and I threatened him. We were cruising down the street, saw him. I told my buddy, turn around. And he was like, bro, I don't think you should do this. And I was like, I'm just going to tell him something. And I told him, I'll catch you slipping, I'm going to kill you, or blah, 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 you piece of crap snitch. And... He ran into somebody's house. He was scared for his life. He called the cops. <clears throat> My parole officer showed up at night. Well, the SWAT parole officers, like, they all showed up in their suit and boot it, whatever. And they were actually really cool. They were like, why did you do that? They were like, listen, man, don't tell nobody nothing. They even told me not to tell the cops nothing. They are like, we're going to try to keep it cool. Hopefully they let it go. We're not going to take you to jail, so don't worry about it right now. Um, we're just going to see what happens because I know you just got out. So let's see what happens. A couple of days go by, my parole officer tells me that I had to come in and talk to her. And obviously, I already knew what that was. She couldn't, she couldn't tell me otherwise. She didn't tell me I was going to go to jail, but I already knew when she called me and that that's what was going to happen. You know, they had to do what they had to do. And uh, so I went in there. Yeah, they arrested me. They took me in. Obviously, I'm on a parole hold, so I couldn't bond out. So I had to spend a year there just fighting it. And... Uh, you know, I could have took a plea bargain. I think they were offering me just a couple of years or something. And my pride, just because I just got out, I couldn't believe that I had, was out exactly seven days. Seven days. And uh, I just couldn't believe it. Did three years, was out seven days, came right back in. I got out July 1st, came right back in July 7th. And so instead of taking a plea bargain, I thought, well, I could beat it. There's no way. The eyewitnesses are saying that I didn't say nothing. And, uh, yeah, my pride got the best of me and they ended up finding me guilty. So I spent a year in there fighting that and they didn't even count that year towards my time. And then when I got sentenced, 
it was uh, Judge Weeks. He was out of Adams County. And, uh, you know, he sat through the whole trial. And actually, a lot of stuff came up through the trial that didn't come out during my first case because I took a plea bargain. You know, just character stuff. And I had a lot of character witnesses on my behalf saying I was a really good guy and stuff like that. That I just, I let drinking and stuff and things get the best of me. And that that guy had stole money from the guy at the party. And then he swung on me first. So the judge heard all that and he seen my daughter in trial and stuff. And uh, it's kind of emotional for me because, he, you know, he showed me a lot of love. And I remember when he, at sentencing, he asked me, he goes, Mr. King, you know, tell me why you think I should, what I should sentence you. You know, tell me something and, uh, before I sentence you. And I told him, Mr. Mr. Weeks, I was like, you see that little girl right there? Because my sentencing range was 8, eight to 24. And keep in mind, they go off mitigating or, you know, uh, aggravated circumstances. And I had no mitigating circumstances. <laughs> there was nothing. It was all aggravated. I was on parole. I was a previous victim. I was violent before. And now I'm threatening to kill him again. You should have threw the book at me. I looked at that little girl and I said, look, if you let me out just enough time to be a father to that little girl, that's all I can ask. And at that time, I think she was only like three or two or three years old. And, uh, and I was like, and if I come back again, you know, obviously I'm not, I didn't, I didn't learn nothing. So if you could just give me enough time to get out and still be a good father to her, that's all I can ask. And, uh, he looked me dead in my and he goes, Mr. King, he goes, based off your case, he goes, my sentencing range is eight to 24. He took his glasses off and he was just looking at me and, uh, I know God was with me, you know, I deserve time, but I know God had his hand in everything. And he says, you have no mitigating circumstances. He was like, I usually go off of like, I base it in the middle, which is what, 16. And then he goes and I'll go up or down from there based on circumstances and stuff. And he got quiet for a second and he looked at me dead in my eye and he goes, I'm gonna send you to eight years or 10 years. I'm gonna send you to 10 years. He goes, your minimum is eight years. He goes, I'm giving you 10. He goes, if I give you eight, he goes, that lady right there, the DA, she was going to file that you didn't, had a disproportionate case in that uh, sentencing range and bring me back here and re resentence you. He goes, so I'm going to give you 10 so they have no ground to stand on. And then uh, he goes, how does that sound? And uh, I told him, thank you. Thank you. Because I really believed I was coming with 18 to 24. I thought I was going to 24. I thought I was done. And, uh, so, you know, I went back into the county and uh, I already made friends with a lot of people and stuff. And I was in the hole for fighting, <laughs> fighting again. And uh, and uh, the guys were like, well, how much time did you get? Ten, how much time did you get? And I was like, ten. And they were like, yeah, you're getting out. And I was like, no, no, no. Ten, ten years. And they were like, oh, and I was happy. I was happy to get ten years. And, uh, you know, you know, I wasn't happy, but compared to the circumstance, I was actually pretty happy. 10 years, I figured I'd be out in like seven or eight or six or something. And uh, so it was, sol it was solitary confinement at that time. And, you know, and I was really depressed. You know, I couldn't believe it. I felt like, I felt like crap. That was probably, the, that was honestly the lowest time in my life, the second lowest time in my life. And I can't explain it how low I felt at that time. Like I, I couldn't believe that I did all that time, got out and I was only out one week and I just let my family down. And I just, and I, my, I wasn't gonna be with my daughter again. I really loved her and I really love her. And, uh, and I just couldn't help. And I just, I just was gonna kill myself. And I, and I had a cord and everything and I was wrapping it up and I wrapped it around the thing and I was just gonna hang myself. And I was just like, I was right there. This was like, I've, I've had multiple suicide attempts. Even since I was young, I, you know, even when I didn't know how to kill myself, I had suicidal thoughts. And at that, at that time, I was just like, I'm done. Like, I, I'm, I'm, I can't believe I'm going to go to prison. I'm going back, like, I'm going to, like, this is just unbelievable. And at that time, something came into my head. It wasn't audible, but it was, a, it was a voice, like something telling me outside myself. And I remember it telling me, if you don't want your life no more, give it to me. And I was like, what? And he was like, if you don't want your life and you don't want to live no more, then just give it to me since you want to die so much. 
give your life to me. And a feeling of light, like it just felt light, like a purpose came over my life, a purpose. And uh, I felt like I could do it at that point. I felt like something had came into me and told me that like, if you want to die so much, then live for me. And at that time I didn't understand, but I did. Like I knew it was the Lord talking to me and, um, and he gave me strength. He gave me so much strength. And I remember reading the word and I don't know what I was reading at that time. If I knew what I was studying, right. But I knew that God was talking to me and I thought, well, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to give my life to God. And I'm going to, and I'm going to, and he filled me with a purpose. Like he gave me purpose. It was not my emotions or feelings. He lifted me up out of that. And, uh, that was my first encounter with Jesus. That was my very first encounter. I remember how, how, how clear as day he came in to that cell and what he was telling me. And that suicidal thoughts left me. Like it, it got me through. And that was my first encounter with Jesus Christ.